Oh, didn't notice you there. Welcome to the Goodest Cast. And if you haven't been here before, welcome to the Goodest Cast. This episode, we have Ken Gushi. And if you don't know who Ken Gushi is, welcome to the planet Earth. Um, Ken Gushi has been drifting in professional drifting for the last 20 years, nonstop. He's been drifting even before that and is before he even had a driver's license and long after before for a long time when he didn't have a driver's license. We'll just say that if you want to hear the backstory of that, check out his episode with Benson on the Silly Mania podcast. They have great chemistry and they cover all of his history on this one. We really get into like where he's at now, kind of his future vision of what drifting and professional drifting is going to look like. You know, the difference between grassroots and pro and like driving skill between the two. Um, I really enjoyed doing this one. I think it was really insightful. Ken's not only funny, but he's a smart dude, man. And it was a a real pleasure to do this. Check it out. Good? Yep. Yep. I'm ready. You know how how to do this. Yeah. (laughs) Just talk, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um... I was listening to your uh, podcast you did with Benson uh-huh. on Silly Lady, the Silly Lady Mania podcast. And first of all, if you haven't listened to that, definitely go listen to it. It's fucking awesome. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and listening to that, I was like, got it. I got to do one with Ken. I literally texted Benson like yeah. right after I listened to it. I was like, yo, man, you think Ken would do my podcast? Like, he's funny, dude. Like, I, yeah. I, like, I got to get him on. So like, yeah. he's like. He'll probably do it. Yeah. Like he'll probably do it. Why not? And I was like, all right. So that's why I hit you up. Uh-huh. And I was like, man, you wanna you wanna come do mine? Yeah. You're like, sure, let's do it. And um, so then we like hung out at Final Bout. Mm-hmm. Um and now Which, was, by the way, is a great event. Yeah, that, that man. was so much fun. Sucks yeah. that you didn't have your car there though. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Uh I think that's next gonna year. be definitely very shortly. Uh hopefully next year. Mm-hmm. It's far, man. It is, um, and transport alone was a pretty big penny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I saw you guys had that hauler with like. Yeah, I mean, it looked badass. If you guys haven't seen like the photos that came out of that trailer, I mean, even the rig itself was like slammed. The driver was cool. He was helping us out through the whole weekend. That was pretty sick. Yeah. Final bow is, uh, I was saying while I was there and telling all the, the people that were there that it was probably. Or not even probably. It was by far the best drifting event I've been to. Really? Yeah. Uh, in my experience as a driver and a participant. Mm. And that's, of course, outside of competition because competition has an entirely different feel. You know, like you got, you have to like do certain things at a competition event. Well, at Final Bout, it's pretty much you just go out there and have fun. All fun. Like all fun. You get to drive with whoever. Yeah. Hang out with whoever. Yeah. You're not like... This is who you're driving against? Right. And there's no pressure. It's just going out there and having fun. Do you... Yeah, because you're doing, like, the professional stuff, Mm -hmm. do you feel that you... I don't know. I I feel like a lot of the... Hey, you can ask me anything. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, some of the the pros, Mm -hmm. um, like, I feel like they go... They they, they only have the, the funding and the ability to do the competition rounds especially like people who are privateers and starting mm-hmm. out and um it's kind of nice to see people like yourself or like mm-hmm. kazuya at these events mm-hmm. and you get to drive with them and kind of like be like oh like this is the level yeah you know? yeah, yeah and like seeing them in their street cars seeing yeah. in your street car that has a sequential it's still a street car <laughs> though <laughs> by the way it's this car right behind us <laughs> yeah yeah uh just basic like is 300 mm-hmm. with 1J, you know? At the time, it was a stock 1J. Yeah. You know? Of course, it had a sequential gearbox, but... Which is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and like... that gearbox actually came straight out of my race car. I was yeah. like, ah, oh, my transmission blew on this car. Well, the reason why I even went sequential on this car is because um, it was the end of the season 2020. And at the same time, I blew second gear out of this one. So I was like, fuck, instead of spending like a grand or 1500 bucks on a 154 or even doing a cd009 swap i had this transmission just laying around and i had no plans for it so i just stuck it in there and 
I think you would agree that every car fanatic would have loved to drive a sequential car on the street at one point in their lives. Absolutely. And so it's I. It's like Gran Turismo, dude. Exactly. You just yeah. Level up your transmission. <laughs> yeah. This <laughs> is like maxed out now. Yeah. yeah. It's so sick. I got you. Like yeah. drove us from the track to the hotel. Later, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I want one. <laughs> I want one. This is so wild. Yeah. Or like watching any like you know growing up like watching like WRC or whatever like yeah yeah they're just, just like sound. rolling through the gears the sound yeah, yeah the, the gear sound. wine <sighs> yeah drivetrain noise is probably one of my favorite noises out of a race car and sometimes yeah. even more so than the engine noise yeah, yeah. I, you know what I I agree with you like when yeah. I heard when I heard you drive that down the street like in just some clip I was yeah. like how much does that cost like <laughs> how much is that like I I want it yeah I, I, and of course going back to your um, your comment about you know these pro drivers only having the ability to do pro events and you know drivers like us i think it just comes down to you know what you enjoy doing and i think the essence for me is i just enjoy drifting as a whole um and i mentioned this earlier but pro competition competitive drifting has an entirely different vibe than the grassroots type events um and doing or being a pro driver for so long uh, because I've been doing it since 2003. So yeah. that's like almost 20 years, 18 years specifically uh, in Formula Drift. But then even prior to that, I was doing D1 Grand Prix. So I've only known pro competition for about 20 years. Um, but I always enjoyed, you know, reading like Option Magazine or Battle Magazine, Drift Tengoku. Yeah. Um, and the grassroots cars, how like stylish they were. And then when, you know, Final Bell made, made itself, um, when it first created itself, I guess. Um, I saw all these badass cars from like the East Coast, the Midwest, NorCal, Seattle area. I was like, shit, like, that's the kind of stuff I want to be doing. Uh, of course, with competitive drifting, because again, I just love drifting. But there's one thing about like seeing these like high horsepower, high budget, thousand horsepower, you know, builds going sideways with a ton of smoke. But it's also another feeling to get when you see like these low horsepower cars that are like slammed to the ground, deep dish, chrome wheels, just big arrow, yeah. big wing. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just so cool, you know. Like I just love the style aspect of that and that's what draws me to both I guess both kinds of drifting. Yeah. I can appreciate that. I I think it's important. We got to have like we got to have in drifting you have to have like the different like subcultures like mm -hmm. like i i don't know people from the outside of like rap or whatever i'm sure they're just like that's rap music you know or like yeah, country yeah. they're like that's country music right. you know but then but there's like, the genre yeah, yeah and you got to have like all these little things and they got to work together and I, I i can appreciate um like now that i've i drove like one of, i drove like a i guess it was a pro one car mm -hmm. i don't know so like donovan brockway let me drive mm -hmm. his uh his e30 that like yeah. ridiculous E30 and it was like I drove it at a uh, Sonoma on the Sonoma like uh, FD layout and I I did one run and I like I linked it but I'm like this is a whole other monster like yeah. it like blew a pair of like one two three S's yeah, off yeah. the car like in right like away. one run yeah. and I'm like this is this is different like mm -hmm. the so like when I watch uh, like the pro stuff it's easy like as a somebody who drifts to like see people make mistakes and stuff mm -hmm. and be like, oh dude, I tanned him. Like, what was you know what was that? But like, it it is a very different. It's a whole approach. different world. Yeah. With that kind of grip and power. Yeah. And like steering angle, it's yeah, it's crazy. So I have a little bit of that in this car too. So I have wise fab steering, obviously yeah. the sequential. Yeah. But it's got full interior AC, radio, subwoofer. Yeah, yeah we were like um, blasting music, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like. <laughs> you need you need the sub, dude. Yeah. All the transmission is just like me. Yeah. Me. Dude, your so ears sick. start bleeding. So <laughs> Usually, I have my music on pretty high. Yeah. yeah. Which is cool. <laughs> and I play like music videos on my head. You I know. I loved it. Display. I was like, dude, this is like, I was like, this is so fucking cool guy shit right now. <laughs> <laughs> what actually inspired me to do that was um, back in I think it was like two thousand. I want to say 2009 or 2010 when they did D1 Grand Prix at Vegas um, and Daigo actually brought, or Daigo Saito brought his uh, street JZX 100 Mark II. Mm. It was all black at the time, slammed on chrome wheels. Full interior, just a cage, a bolt-on cage. Uh. 
and he had like three displays on a dashboard what? just playing like hip hop no music, way. music videos the whole That's time so while in competition. And he had his AC running because it was fucking hot in Vegas. <laughs> I was like, man, that's a real drift car. You know, yeah. it's like a street car or it's a car that can be driven on the street. Slammed, stylish, full aero, full interior, AC, head unit that plays music videos. So that's kind of what I try to replicate with this one. Yeah, that's working. Yeah. It worked for me. I was like, huh. I think I'm missing something here. Like, <laughs> I mean, stripped out cars are cool too, but I, I drive this car a lot on the street. And of course, I don't want, you know, I, I want some sort of like luxury amenities if I'm going to be yeah. spending a lot of time in traffic and stuff. Yeah. Like a sequential. Like a sequential. Yeah. I mean, that's totally. <laughs> if you were to ask me if I would do it again, I would say no, definitely not. Really? Yeah. No more sequentials <laughs> on the street. There's, I think one's enough. And yeah. Yeah. So. Going to Final Bout, mm -hmm. doing events like that, driving with driving with uh, you know, people who maybe at one point wanted to be professionals but like, you know, couldn't couldn't do it. Like what uh I mean, what do you what do you like compare the skill level to? Like, are there people at these grassroots events that have like potential talent to do maybe the professional stuff, or is it just such a different sport at this point? No. There's definitely a lot, a lot of unrecognized talent at these grassroots events, like like Panama. Actually, funny you bring that up. They had this uh, tandem competition. You, you judged it, mm -hmm. and uh, I had my car, and I went up against um, Julio. Yeah. Holy cow, he's good. Yeah, he's he's good, really man. good. So if you put him in a car with like, or something that's similar to like an FD Pro One spec car, I'm sure he would kick ass. Hmm. He would kill it. Yeah, if you can do something in a low horsepower car to that level of driving, um, it's actually surprisingly easier to drift in a car that has a ton of power, a ton of steering angle, and a ton of tire. Because mm. yeah. there's a lot more room for uh, mistakes because you can recover easier. Yeah, and like the speeds, I was, like when I was when I was watching, so like I remember being at Sonoma and seeing you drive. Mm -hmm like oh when we were out in there? the stands okay yeah like i was like That's a, a long time ago yeah i mean like i know we're not that far apart in age yeah but like i, I remember them being like this is young guy can yeah, yeah, and yeah. i was like oh like my, my someone close to my age like i could do this you know like that yeah. was a long time ago i remember like leaving leaving the track in my i had an ls 400 at the mm -hmm. time and it had a factory lsd mm -hmm. and i didn't know i didn't know what a diff was like, yeah, yeah i was like 16 or whatever yeah. actually it was my mom's car so it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't mine it was my mom's car but i, I was like yeah. manjing like leaving the yeah, track yeah. and stuff and i was like i gotta do this and then like i kind of like lost it at one point but i came back and but yeah I, I remember seeing you drive back then and it was like excited you had like the kind of like exciting driving style mm. that like you know we all chase you know mm. what i mean so um like on the i did a podcast with julian and he was talking mm. about how like you and benson were yeah, like yeah. definitely um like inspiration to him and his oh. driving style i don't yeah so like it i think i think there's something to be said about the driving style that we want to do mm. and like maybe that's the reason why you enjoy the you know events like final bout where we're kind of like yeah. pushing for yeah, that yeah. it doesn't matter about like the car or the right. horsepower it's like it's purely like that technique and mm -hmm. style i think technique and style is huge and it constantly changes right like if you were to compare drifting like the same drifting you saw in sonoma to the styles of drifting see nowadays it's entirely different like it's way snappier now it's like crazy high rate angle yeah. rotate rate to rotate or rate rotation rate to angle it's all it's all like crazy now and you know as a driver you constantly try to learn you know like what's the next like big thing that's going to separate my driving self from the rest of the rest of the uh, the field and honestly like julian style is pretty badass all you guys all you guys from animal style have yeah. like pretty good style and i can see that there's a huge uh, naoki influence for sure in the way you guys drive yeah and i i didn't i i just wanted to drive like julian mm -hmm. and then julian just wanted wants to, to drive, drive like, like naoki. naoki right and it's like i think everyone wants to drive like naoki until now. i saw naoki yeah, drive yeah. and i was like 
Julian's sick, but I'm trying to drive like yeah, that, dude. dude you know? He's sick, man. I think I would say about 90% of the field, and even in FD USA, aspire to drive like him. Really? Yeah. Just like, I don't know. He has this like, don't give a fuck yeah. attitude. That's and you can best. see it while he's driving. Yeah, you're you like, know? how? Yeah. Uh. It's just so, so aggressive and like super snappy, like high excitement level driving. Yeah. That's enjoyable to watch. Yeah. yeah. I I it's really interesting to know that like people who are on a professional level mm -hmm. like still uh admire that. Yeah, of of course. And I, when we see like what's cool, like we're not gonna be like, oh well, like you know, yeah like, eh, wink wink my dick with someone else. <laughs> it's like we we really admire like real talent. Sick. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think it matters if you're a pro driver or an amateur. Like when we see like grassroots guys pull off some crazy shit, yeah, like, it's crazy shit. Yeah. Like crazy shit is crazy shit. You I know, love like it. Good, good runs are good runs, and it doesn't matter if that's coming from a pro one driver or like a driver you find at like final bound stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I, yeah, I think that there's like a stigma of people like assume that mm -hmm. the pros kind of like look down or something. And I, I really, I'm starting to learn that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the more that I talk to like, I mean, any, any of the, any of the pros really like there's a, it's a, it's a common thing. Like we're mm -hmm. all doing the same thing. And they, like, I think there's an understanding like these, you know, these kids are like putting everything they have into this, Yeah, you know, just, yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine doing like the pro stuff. Like I can't imagine the kids that are like, Aspire. Like I remember, I remember I wanted to do FD. Like I was like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do FD. I'm gonna be sick, dude. Yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna, like get. I'm gonna bring my S13, dude. Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna show up, and then like, I just realized like, oh, I, I don't think I can build and maintain a car <laughs> like that good, and it's expensive. Yeah. So, two years ago, no, 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 in 2017, I actually, uh, no, it was. So 2016, I established Kengushi Motorsports as a company or a corporation. And in 2018, I took over the entire motorsports program from Grady Performance. Mm. Um, so now I run the team. I operate the team. Wow. Um, so I'm a team owner slash operator slash driver for my team. And, of course, we get support from you know Toyota Motorsports or Toyota Gazoo Racing. And I have all these sponsors that support my program um but i realized how hard it is to compete at this level uh, as a team, team owner. owner yeah because you got to worry about everything the car prep uh, the finances the logistics your crew uh, even down to like the food that your crew's eating the hotel <laughs> uh, everything right so you plan for everything maintenance uh, spare parts trailer maintenance truck maintenance so you get all that figured out get to the track after driving you know five days on the road to the east coast and then you finally have to prepare for competition so you yeah. go through like car prep practice qualify competition yeah you have you to know. totally change mindsets yeah you're like now now i'm in kill mode yeah yeah like i, I was in businessman mode right. now i gotta go into kill mode yeah. oh i gotta take a break and go into like you know personality mode yeah, and like yeah back like to fan service and whatnot so yeah it's, it's a ton of work that a lot of people don't really see behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, but also fun. Like, it's really fun to get to be able to manage all this and see the program grow into something bigger than what you thought it was. Do you think drifting will ever get to a point where there'll be, like... I, I, right now, there's probably only, like, a couple teams that have team owners and drivers. Mm. The rest of it's all, like, privateer, like, yeah. for the most part. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you think that we'll ever see in professional drifting, like, teams and there'll be drivers? And We're starting to see that already. Um, so just this year, I'm sure a lot of guys that are into drifting know the name Von Gittin Jr. Mm -hmm. um, he's also the same team owner, operator, slash driver. And yeah. he decided to take a step back from competitive drifting this year to focus on other things in his life. And uh, he's probably... You know, one of the biggest names, if not the most successful guy in pro drift in the world. Yeah. Um, that's, that's made a name for himself and established a brand called RTR and that produces, you know, these custom one-off vehicles sold through Ford dealerships. Which is crazy. Which is crazy. That's like having a 
Ken Gushi signature, you know, GT86 at Toyota. How that, sick would that be? That though? would be unreal. Uh, so he's actually I'll made that one. for himself. You would buy, I'll buy one, Ken. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. That's my first customer right there. But um, so we're starting to see that already, that transition from, you know, driver to now owner and then hiring these young drivers um, as the next generation superstars. Um, another name that you guys are probably familiar with is Steph Papadakis. Yeah. You know, the owner of the uh, Rockstar Papadakis racing team. Uh, at one point, he was driving in Formula Drift. I didn't know that. You didn't know that, He was right? a driver? He was a driver. What? Yeah, he was an AEM driver. He's been with AEM for a long time. Mm. But he was driving an S2000 in Formula Drift. Whoa. Um, I don't want to badmouth him, but he never really made it that far in competition. <laughs> so now you can say... And it's pretty obvious that he's really, really talented as a team owner. Yeah. And, of course, machinist, builder, and now a YouTube sensation because he's got a pretty good following on YouTube now, too. Yeah. Do you got to have, like, all of it. Yeah. You got to do the YouTube stuff. Like, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I forgot to mention this earlier, but as a team owner, you have to get your name out there. So I actually started or tried to start, like, a YouTube channel, too, and I, I had so no idea. How, yeah. Oh my God. The filming part is one thing, but the editing yeah. and then the publishing and then trying to monetize everything. Yeah. Coming up with the content. Or you like pay somebody a ton of money to do it. And or it's like, that. And, and it's, it's like super like, time like consuming. 300 views. Yeah. It's like, I don't know how these guys do it with YouTube, but yeah. I guess one, one guy that I was talking to who's uh, got a pretty solid following was saying all it takes is one video mm. to like trend and skyrocket and then everything else is just gonna like start going up like trickling down to the other videos that you have on the channel so um consistency is key they were saying and huh. of course i haven't really been posting videos on youtube lately so i have no consistency but it's tough man yeah it's tough like we got to do all these things to make sure we keep our sponsors happy you know fans up to date and whatnot while going out there and trying to have fun and also trying to win and trying to win, yeah, and perform. You're like you're you're a you're an athlete. Yeah, businessman. Businessman, right? So <laughs> now you understand. Entertainer, entertainer, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now you start to understand like why I enjoy these grassroots type events because there's absolutely none of that kind of pressure. Yeah, you're not like, worrying about like what your what your team's gonna eat. Right. You're like, like you're just, I'm just gonna go get yeah, some food. Yeah, yeah. Gene and Jude's, you know. Gene and Jude's. <laughs> Did you try it? Yeah, oh, I went. Dude, it's so good, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that place is that so a, good. That was an excellent recommendation. Yeah. That was the last thing I ate before I left Chicago. Yeah, if you guys are ever, ever in Chicago, and it's close to the airport too. Yep. Yeah, Gin and Jude's hot dogs. Yeah, it's cheap. It's cheap. It's good. Yeah, it's like drunk food. Yeah, pretty much. Um. So. Because of because of because you've been in FD so long, mm -hmm. like what have you seen? I guess so. Like in grassroots lately, like the trend has kind of been going, you know, more rear grip, mm -hmm. um, like kind of like different knuckle setups for like more snappy mm -hmm. transitions and stuff. Not necessarily for like high speed bank stuff or high speed sweepers. Mm -hmm. It's more like uh, fast transition, like kind of right. short course stuff, at least like in our world mm -hmm. and my like immediate group of friends. Sure. Um, and that's only really because we went to Japan and watched people drive way better than we've ever will be mm -hmm. able to. Like Mayhan. Yeah. You go to yeah, Mayhan yeah. and it's like, there's like dudes you've never seen their car yeah, on yeah. the internet and they're yeah. like kicking ass. You're like, Oh, I don't even know how to drift. You know, like, <laughs> there's like, like the yeah. girlfriends that are there just like hanging out and yeah. going to drive or like yeah. 90 on the wall. And you're like, what, what? Yeah. There, there's, there's a ton of unnoticed talent in drifting. Yeah. And, and that's not just Japan to this everywhere, everywhere yeah. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was on YouTube the other day and like an Indonesian like drift, championship popped up mm -hmm. and i was like dude they have like professional level drifting in indonesia yeah you know like yeah, like yeah. they have them all over the place yeah. and it's like i've never heard of any of mm -hmm. these people but i i look i look at myself as like a lifer like diehard drifter yeah, like yeah. drift fan and like i've you know it's kind of crazy it's like grown so much it has it really has and i think it's going to continue to grow like the way i see it is every year there's progression in the sport. And like you mentioned, there's progression in the grassroots stuff too, like rear tire grip and different knuckles. 
there's always going to be progression in pro drift too because naturally it's a competition and drivers want to win. So yeah. they're going to always try to find an edge on the rest of the field. Uh, more recently, the trend, well, of course, in competitive drifting, tandem is, you know, the main point of competition, yeah, right? You, you want to beat the tandem. Or you want to win the tandem competition. So naturally, the trend is to have better chase runs, like tighter chase runs, mimicking rotation, angle, and just out driving your opponent. Uh, not only that, but like watching drivers like, you know, Naoki and even James Dean, like these guys have really fine tuned their driving, uh, their solo runs as well. So if you watch these guys qualifying runs, like it, they really are in a whole different spectrum as far as skills go from the rest of the field. And, you know, we, we try to mimic that or even try to outdo that. So. When guys like Naoki pop up, you're like, fuck, like, how, how do I set up my car to make it drive like that? Like, how do I change my driving style to do yeah. that? So that's usually the trend in how we see competition is just like, just trying to find the edge. and Yeah, without going over. Right. Yeah. I mean, I watching, watching Irwindale, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, like having cars like side by side on the like I know on a bank if you lift you're in the wall right like, yeah and yeah, so yeah. like I was thinking about this the other day like you know in grassroots people are like oh left foot braking that's stupid you know like why would you need that and then I was thinking like well if you're behind somebody on a bank and they left foot brake like you can't just like e-brake check up a bunch yeah, of times no, like yeah. you're, you're going in the wall yeah so like it's like I don't know I feel like there's all these techniques that you just kind of have to have in your bag of tricks. To you like have to yeah. throw at these random situations. For sure. And you have to be ready for it like almost instantaneously, yeah. right? Like left foot braking is a tool that I want to say 100% of us use in pro drift. Yeah. Uh, and that's not because we're scared of going too fast and we want to like control the speed. But it's also because, like you said, if we lift in certain situations, our front end is going to snap the other way and we're into the wall. What we use left foot braking for the most part is just to stabilize the car you know in drift and of course when we're chasing like we don't want to lift on the throttle so we just modulate the brakes to control the speed while chasing instead of checking up on the handbrake a million times and your car is now all of a sudden doing this twitchy movement and it looks bad on the judges so um yeah that's just a part of the tool that we have to use i mean we don't have to use but yeah you should be able to know how to use yeah it's something that you should be able to be able to do i right. guess yeah yeah uh is there anything is there anything in pro drifting that like does not work at the on the grassroots level uh i don't think so i think you can pretty much apply everything in pro drift to grassroots yeah and vice versa like what you do in grassroots you can always apply to uh competitive pro drifting how do you and the, the difference is well, the biggest difference is horsepower. Right? Like, pro, if you go to a grassroots event, you're never gonna find like thousand horsepower, like yeah, two ninety five, forty eighteens on the yeah. rear, or like even three fifteen <laughs> nittos. Um, I don't even run that size on my street car or my grassroots car. It's a, I think a two fifty five in the rear and a two fifteen up front. Mm. Um, that's but that's because I don't have that kind of power. Yeah, under my hood it's, to it's spend all about, 295s. It's all about the ba- it's all about the balance. It really it really is about the balance. And that's that can be applied to pro drift as well. Like if you have, you know, even if you have like a thousand horsepower, but you're like too hooked up, too gripped up, it's gonna be super hard to drive and you're probably not gonna have a good time is, on track. So it's all about balance, finding the right tire pressure, suspension setups, even alignment uh, for that given track. Is that like the biggest quest in professional drifting? Is like finding the rear grip and like getting that correct i guess yeah so our goal at the end of practice is to have a car that's it's as grippy as it can be without sacrificing drivability Mm. so if your car is too hooked up but you can't get it to rotate at a certain corner then maybe you should probably take away some grip yeah sacrifice the grip there but make it easier to drive yeah yeah so and then that works on grassroots i mean like i I was just an event at event at an event on Saturday mm-hmm. where someone asked me to drive their car and it was like Hard way to too gripped up. And I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? Like yeah, this yeah. is impossible to drive. And yeah. 
like go go up like in the and and i like a, a grippy rear setup yeah, i mean yeah. this was like Super almost good. undrivable yeah. i was like you know and it it's it's i guess it's all like a learning process it is and a lot of it comes from experience as well like if you if you go out there like some if you have a lot of experience that these pro guys have you'll know almost instantaneously like one one lap oh fuck the car's way too grippy so you like yeah. you, you know you stiffen up the suspension air up the tires or you know, change toe um, for grassroots events, I actually try not to mess with the car too much. Yeah, because you're um, just there to drive and have yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. So I, I go with a super pressure. loose setup yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Um, like 50 PSI and rear tire pressures. <laughs> yeah, you're like, like, I that. don't want to have to think about it at yeah, all. Yeah. What was that? I don't know. I think we're okay, though. Okay. It's still recording. I guess. We'll be fine. <laughs> I haven't heard that noise before, though. You have not? No, but oh, this is new, shit. so whatever. Okay. If you say so. I hope it's been recording this whole time. It is. All right. And it's recording on this one, too, so I got to back up just in case. Two places. Cool. I always got to do it like that. Um, yeah, so watching... Yeah, like watching you drive at, like, a fun event, like, you're definitely... It like shows in your driving that mm. you're like just there for a good time. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to like I don't know how to describe that. Like I rode with you and you're like you're close and you're you know like on everybody's shit, but like you you know you're not like trying to be Mister Professional like oh yeah, know, yeah yeah crunching everyone's door in and like <laughs> being crazy like yeah. you're like you're just having fun and yeah. like I I kind of like to see that. It's funny you mentioned that. Like that's the kind of feeling that I want to bring into competitive drifting mm. but it's so hard because we're constantly chasing setup and there's 30 other drivers doing the same thing they're, they're constantly chasing setup so at the event you get there watching practice it's always like this like oh he gets better oh then i get better and he gets better and the whole field just starts climbing mm. up and now we're all of a sudden we're like way faster way closer to the wall tighter tandems whatnot so that's the kind of pressure that we have to deal with at competitions that we don't really see at grassroots events. Yeah. yeah. All that pressure is gone. All that pressure is gone. How do you how do you deal with the pressure of the like I mean you've been doing this a long time. Yeah. I feel like you probably have to have it pretty figured out by now. You would think so, right? <laughs> you would think so. But I still till this day get so nervous for qualifying. I don't know why. Really? Like I, I remember telling myself like when I first started, like, oh, if I if I'm still drifting ten years down the line, and this was twenty years ago too. Yeah. So I told myself, if I'm still drifting ten years down the line, I'm pretty sure my nerves are gonna calm down for qualifying. And guess what? It has not one bit. I still get so nervous for qualifying. And like even before like competition battles, you're like kind of like so anxious and nervous. Um, but once you once the basically once the green flag drops or the lights go out, it's like game on. And yeah, you forget you, about all the nerves. Wow, and it's like kill mode. And Sick. it's so interesting that I find that because I don't know what it is, but there's a trigger within all of us that just switches that mode. Mm. Yeah. And you can talk to all the pro drivers, and they'll tell you the exact same thing. So it's like an adrenaline thing. Like you're I sitting on the is. line, and you're just nervous, and then you're like, "I have to do this. Like yeah, I've, yeah. I've left the line. Yeah. Like we're going into the first yeah. corner. Like m brain, stop thinking. Yeah, yeah. Like we need to process. Yeah. You know? And I actually enjoy that feeling. Really? Like, okay, I like that. Yeah, like I'm like so nervous, and like the the lights drop. You're like, okay, fuck, boom. The mood changes. The whole air changes, and you're just throwing it into turn one. Sick. You know? And and. and Sometimes I'm like, fuck, if I crash here, you know, oh, well, yeah, just go for it. I like that. Yeah. I like that mentality. I mean, like, yeah. I feel like that's one thing that's kind of hard to translate to the to the like grassroots level is the, like mm -hmm. if I crash, I crash. But like I, once I got over that, mm -hmm. my driving got so much better. Yeah. Because you're yeah. not thinking about you the will, car anymore. Sure. You're just yeah. thinking about you're not even thinking about what you're doing. You're mm -hmm. just doing it. Yeah. You know, Um and that's like something that I wish you could like bottle up and sell to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, you know. And it's not something you can like easily explain either. Yeah. You know. Like easy it's easier said than done. They can yeah. always tell people like, seriously, don't worry about the car. If you crash, who cares? We'll fix it. But no, in the back back of your mind, like, <laughs> oh, I, I don't want to crash. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I yeah, yeah. don't really want to hit that rear quarter panel. But yeah, sometimes all of that just has to go out the window and you just have to go for it. And that's why. That's why, like, 
the top drivers are always the top drivers because they can easily forget about that, those worries yeah and just switch to the mode like instantly yeah yeah i think it comes with experience and time experience time and unfortunately like your financial status like if yeah, you have a lot like, of money like if i wad this car yeah, or, you, you know build like, another one yeah you know, it's like, fine yeah. but there are drivers out there that put every single penny of their savings into it and they really can't afford to crash yeah. and break parts. And those guys are the ones that are usually suffering mid-pack to bottom pack. Yeah. Because they can't really push They're the like car if I If I total this, I'm this, the season's done. Right, right. So it's, um, it is an expensive sport. And it, it's getting even more expensive every year because the, prog the natural progression of the sport, cars get faster. You yeah. Know, and you, ha you start using real motorsports parts like... Who would have thought we would be using sequential gearboxes and pro drift crazy. cars, right? That's and crazy. winter's quick change differentials? Yeah. It's crazy. These are like real motorsports grade parts that we're using in drifting. Like no one would have ever saw that coming yeah. 10 years ago. Like in like when you first started drifting, yeah. it was pretty yeah. much uh like stock what 240 diff, yeah, K yeah. trans, yeah. R two hundred R two hundreds, yeah. Yeah, K trans, yeah, like yeah. S, maybe SR trans. Yeah, running like, like a two forty five tire. In if the back. that, I was running two fifteens for the longest time on no my SR team. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so times have definitely changed. The budgets are like way high. Um, equipment is expensive. You got to have spares of everything. Like basically, yeah. you have to have spares enough spares to build a secondary car without the shell. You know, in your trailer. Ready to go at any time. What do you think, like, the biggest change was? Uh, like, the biggest year? Like, what was, like, the biggest jump where you, like, came back the next year, like, oh, yeah, uh, this is different? I mean, every year we saw, like, you know, growth and progression and, like, you know, cars using different parts. But one specific year was 2012. Yeah. When Daigo came to FD with, like, 1,200 horsepower. Yeah, and everybody was still, and like, he, six or yeah, seven. Yeah, he just completely annihilated everyone, like, smoked everyone, crazy tandem. He had the holes in his fender, so, like, yeah. all the smoke would just, like, blind yeah. you pretty much. He, I would say he changed the game in U.S. drift. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but that was the difference in car build. Like, he had, you know, sequential box Yeah. Uh, with the Hollinger gearbox. Um, 1200 horsepower. Yeah. A crazy spec drift car. And even in Japan, he changed the game in Japan too with that same style of car build. Really? And now everyone's doing the same thing. But he was one iconic driver that changed the game. Uh, James Dean, not with the car builds exactly, but with his driving style, like his consistency, his um, like robot like, yeah, robot like consistency. Like every lap was just. Yeah. Unreal. His chase is just... Yeah, and that was in 2017 when yeah. he first came. And he won the championship three years in a row. Yeah. So that's a testament to his you know, consistency. Basically, every year that he was here, he had the championship. Yeah, which is unreal. Unreal, yeah. I I actually didn't... Wa I'll be honest, I don't watch like a ton. I, I watched it this year mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm... I'm more like... I have a closer connection to people who are doing the pro stuff, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. hanging out with you, fun about sure. I'm like, oh, I want to see Ken do well. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or like driving with Kazuya right. and like, oh, I want to see Kazuya do well. Or right. like, you know, people that you go to the track, I think that's, I think is, that's. Is that going to get in the. Ah, it'll be all right. all right. It's not, this. these mics are pretty good yeah. at not picking stuff up. Yeah. Um. But as far as like, I think that's why going to those types of events as a pro driver is great for mm -hmm. uh like you i don't know how to explain it like it puts you on a level with everybody who's like take like takes drifting seriously mm -hmm. or that at least drifting and like when people see you at events like that they're like oh like this is you know he's one he's one of the guys he's one of the he's one of the drift people mm -hmm. like it's mm -hmm. not like this like pedestal thing yeah that's one thing i've always i guess loved about drifting was that you do see pro guys going to these grassroots events like chelsea denofa he's always at grassroots yeah grassroots events up in the northwest and um and that's 
simply because we just enjoy drifting at all levels. Yeah. And there's no such thing as like, oh, I'm like, I'm, I'm a pro professional, so don't don't talk to me. You know, there's yeah. There's never a barrier between the grassroots guys, the street guys, and pro guys. We're all, we all enjoy the same thing. Yeah. Like I enjoy grassroots events. I enjoy pro drift. Um, and I actually enjoy driving with grassroots drivers because. Like you always find something you can learn. Even I still find till this day stuff that I learn from watching grassroots drivers compete at grassroots events or even doing events like Final Bell or Super D and stuff. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I did wonder that. Like I wonder if there if there's any like because you know, we're learning from you guys. Mm -hmm. Like I was wondering if you're learning from us. Yeah. And that's I mean, that's a beautiful thing, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, it's all fun, you know. Like we, we go there because it's fun. Yeah yeah we enjoy it at do, all levels do you do you feel like uh, how do i say this where where do you like where do you gain your um like when you're trying to learn like a new technique mm -hmm. or does it just do you just see something and you're like oh like i can do that or are you like, are you studying people's like movements or in car or, like what's everything everything yeah. you just mentioned we do um, we try to watch, or like, I'll find myself watching even events like, you know, D1 or like RDS or even a lot of the grassroots events. Yeah, the RDS stuff is crazy. It's nuts. Yeah, 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 I like. High level for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're, there's some insane drivers in that. And yeah. Like the courses that they run are all like mega high speed. Yeah. It's kind of. Like more than two corners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you watch these drivers and like, wow, that was kind of badass like i wonder how he did it like what kind of technique he's using so you try to like look for onboard clips and you know you just study their techniques and then you try to replicate that either in real life like competition or in my case i play a lot of aceto corsa yeah um, and so i try to see like okay what was he doing i want to see if i can replicate that in a, a simulator like essentially yeah. a simulator yeah um and then i'll apply what i learned from that to like real life drifting and events like like or events at what is it apple valley speedway yeah where i take my street car i'll be like i wonder if i can do that style initiation or that flick or that yeah. rate to angle um and see if it works i feel like i feel like aceto is a requirement at this point if you want to get better yeah like these kids that just play nothing but a seto and then go do like a couple drift events can like tandem dude like, so for me like it took me like 20 events yeah yeah to like feel comfortable chasing somebody crazy story um so i have a buddy in japan shinji minoa who runs Heyman products um, they, and he's been in like pro drift for a long time starting in d1 uh, with the old corolla and now he drives a his signature jzx 90 um but him and his wife, Masayo, has a 12-year-old son right now who is absolutely ripping it. And if you guys want to check it out, his, his, he has an Instagram, a bunch of videos on it of him just ripping his mom and dad's car at different tracks. Dude, he, this kid it. is 12 years old, and the way he got good is by playing a set of Corsa, a lot of a set of Corsa. And this was literally only like maybe a year or two ago that he hopped on and... Yeah, he's uh, kicking ass in MSC. He's actually, he just announced he's, that he's going to be doing FDJ2, which is the Pro Spec series in Japan. Japan. Yeah, at Suzuka. At 12 years old? At 12 years old. I mean, it helps to have a dad and mom like Shinji and Masayo yeah. because they have like Pro Spec or yeah. Pro level drift cars. And his you know, mom drifts too, right? Yeah, and his mom is a badass. Dude, I've seen her drive. His she mom is, is crazy so good. good. Yeah, yeah. She has a. I think JZX, JZX 100. Yeah. yeah. So she had a chaser, JZX 100 chaser. Now she just finished her uh, 100 Mark II that she's competing in. And she actually did great at Fuji the last round that they had a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, she's and unreal. So that's like a real drift family. Mom yeah. that mom drifts, dad drifts, and now the 12-year-old son drifts. I had never seen that until I went to Japan for the first time. Yeah. I went to Ebisu for uh -huh. like uh, one of the Mod Series 2016. And I saw a whole family. Yeah. And they all had matching jumpsuits. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, get out of here. Yeah, it's like, a whole culture out dude, there. That's a way that of was, life. That like made my trip. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. like, dude, this is a th this could be a thing, you know? Like, yeah. you know, because if you've been doing it this long, you don't want to like give it up. You know, like if you ever start a family and like, you know, you think like, I want to keep doing this. Like, yeah, and it's something you can enjoy as a family, yeah. you know. Um, but 
the way I see it, I'm mean, obviously I don't have family, I'm not married, I don't have kids. But for someone that's been in the sport for like almost 20 years and as a team owner, you start to realize like, okay, maybe it is soon time to take a step back and let kids like Hiroya at 12 years old mm -hmm. uh, have an opportunity to be in a seat that you once had. So then that's why like, you know, Vaughn's taking a step back, guys like die every time because us older generation, like I, I, I want to call us first generation American pro drivers yeah, have been in it for so are. long. Yeah. I actually have never missed a single round of FD, which is crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, you're you're the only one, right? Uh, Forsberg too. Forsberg, myself, Di, and Jr. were the only four that's been in it since day one. But obviously, two of them retired, so now it's just Forsberg and I. Crazy. So I don't want to say like my days are numbered, but you start to realize like when you see kids like Hiroya at 12 years old coming into the sport, like yeah, I, I kind of want to help him. Yeah, like, I want to help him become successful so you start to wonder like what well, is you there? have all this knowledge man yeah you knowledge have you have the equipment knowledge, knowledge cars yeah. network for sponsors right so we have the tools to create a team and an opportunity for the future of drifting and that's kind of what goes through our minds like you know myself jr so that's what i wanted to get to earlier when we were talking about this yeah um but yeah anyway this kid is phenomenal he has a bunch of videos online so if you guys have a chance just check it out it's I'm, I'm crazy gonna, to I'm see what a 12 year old can do yeah just with like a little bit of simulator practice i mean like because I, I don't know about you i yeah. played a ton of like gran turismo when i was mm. a kid i or did if, too or if i yeah. went to the arcade it was yeah. like where's the driving game yeah, yeah you know like i was yeah. i didn't care about anything else i was like where's the driving game mm -hmm. if it's you know cruising usa or whatever like it's not really a good practice but like you yeah. know like but at least you have a steering wheel and yeah, a shifter and you yeah. have a clutch yeah like i think yeah. i learned how to drive stick on like uh san francisco rush <laughs> like to be totally mm -hmm. honest yeah because i was like oh it's got a third pedal what's that for and yeah i yeah, was yeah. like oh it's a manual transmission yeah. you know and i was like yeah i used to love try that. it yeah dude yeah but like those aren't really great simulators they no. were good like it was a good like window but yeah now, now it's like the simulators are getting better and like yeah. vr dude if i was 13 if I was 10, if I was mm. nine years old playing VR Assetto, imagine how you would be at 30. Well, I mean, the real life example is Hiroya. Yeah. Like he's exactly. been on the simulator for two years and he's like, he literally rips it hard. So kids have it. Good now. You know? I don't have a team. I don't have a team to put these kids on. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I have a platform. I, mean, but, I, could, but for, I could promote these kids. Like that's that's the cool part. About yeah, and doing also like, like this. you you still enjoy driving, so yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and if you put, you know, if you get to the point where you're like, if you're like putting a kid on your team, mm -hmm. and I don't know, you do the like F1 style thing where it's like, you know, you're like the team principal or something expert you, well even like, or like even consultant just, like you you've been or like on an f1 they usually have like a young driver and an older driver sure and then the older driver like you know teaches game to the younger driver mm -hmm. and they progress way faster because it's like oh you're doing this wrong or like oh like in this situation mm -hmm. you know i mean i guess you don't have to be driving also to do that but yeah um you can still jump in the car and show them what to do right you, you, yeah you can especially yeah. like but yeah, I mean, you see that in F1, like, uh, what's his name? The dude from the movie. Uh, he just passed away. But he was like a consultant into his like. Oh, you're talking 80s. about Nicky Lauda. Nicky Lauda. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Like racing driver. Yeah, Mercedes. Like team principal. Then he's yeah. just like, I'll be a consultant. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's a cool path that you could lead you know i mean i will say i'm not as old as nikki so yeah no, I, mean, I mean like still, i'm just saying like you had yeah, yeah there's a lot of things we can do as a team owner and you know a former I, i'm not i'm still not a former because i'm current but down the line yeah, let's just say you know five years ten years down the line like what is there that i can do to help a sport that i'm so passionate about retain its momentum um, without you know going black because who knows motorsports is so volatile and all aspects because one it's com entirely unnecessary like you don't really need motorsports right nah. we do it because we're adrenaline junkies yep. and fans love watching us adrenaline junkies potentially wreck our cars into a wall or something <laughs> right that's that's motorsports Dude, honestly, in a nutshell it's ridiculous but like 75 percent of the stands is there like to watch carnage yeah yeah it really is you yeah. go to a nascar race oh dude dude yeah. fans go 
buck wild when you see an accident, yeah. like 10 car pile up. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just naturally how it is within more sports is just chaos hunting. Yeah. So in that sense, racing is not really a necessary thing in life. It's um, not. But, but, but in a business perspective, because so many eyes are on it, it's a good opportunity to represent or to even promote a brand. Right. Obviously, that's why we have big logos on the car. Yeah. You know, Toyota Motorsports, uh, Motul, Next, and all these sponsors that help us keep our program going are there to advertise their brand on the car because there's so many eyes on the sport. So racing became this like business model like long time ago when, you know, Formula One started and all these like racing um, organizations started. But if you look at like the natural progression of just the world in general about going green. Yeah, yeah. Know, no, like, I'm worried it, about it. Yeah, like the, if, the fuel efficiency. Where does drifting lie in that spectrum? Because yeah. for one, we're burning through tire, a set of tires and what, 45 seconds, all the smoke goes into the air. Yeah. We're uh, burning gasoline. Yeah. You know, like where do we see that in 10 years, 20 years? This is... <laughs> It's crazy. It's like, something really that I think to... about often and yeah, it really yeah, yeah. worries me. Like it yeah. really worries me because I I feel like we're going to have to like either figure out some kind of like tire compound yeah, that that's not so bad. That's not so bad, yeah. right? That's like drift only. Mm-hmm. Uh we're going to have to we're going to have to do something cuz like eventually they're going to be like all these other motorsports are electric. Yeah. All like, you know, they're, you know, their tires last them the entire race. Yeah, I mean we have event well, we have racing Formula E, which is all electric Formula yeah. cars. Even it's like kind of boring though. It is. It, it really is. There's no sound and no yeah. sound means no soul. Like yeah. that's why I say like Tesla's, yeah, sure, they're fast in a straight line, but they have no soul. Yeah. Like, they have no soul. I, I yeah. don't know how else to put it. There's no sound. You know. I, I hear you. Yeah. I'm I think at some point we're gonna it's gonna be like a necessary. Mm-hmm. Like and it's sad. And I think that day is gonna be really fucking hard for a lot of people but it is and that's why i say like what can i do as someone that's been in the sport for so long that can help promote you know the sport that i'm still very passionate about into lasting the next 10 years 20 years i don't know i I still don't know but i think the first step is to make sure that we get the next generation hyped about it yeah and then give them an opportunity to you know, grow into something that we once were, and if not bigger and better. I know. mean, yeah, man, I was one of those kids. I'm you. You probably surpassed that because you were in a, like, you you were drifting from what, like, fourteen? I was 15? like thirteen years old. Yeah, <laughs> like drifting, that's crazy. Yeah. You were you were that kid. That's, yeah, I that's, was that kid exactly. I was given part. an opportunity from, you know, mentors like Reese Millen, you know, Sam Huben. These were the. The yeah, original those, guys that those made it big. Good, those are some good mentors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they gave me an opportunity. Um, so funny story. Before I was with Toyota, I actually had a factory ride with Ford Motorsports. I remember Ford when racing. you drove a Mustang. Yeah. yeah. I was in a Mustang for three years. The guy who got me that deal was Reese Millen. Really? He was the one that tied me together mm. with Ford and gave me the opportunity to become something that was bigger than what my dad was able to provide. Yeah. Because until that point... It was my dad that funded my S13 builds. You know, he bought me my first SR20. We built a team out of Gucci Auto with like this low budget program. And then I had the opportunity to hop into Ford. Yeah. So I was like, I can be that person to get a kid into, you know, my program and give an opportunity to go way beyond their like now capabilities. Yeah. What would you, what would you look for in that person? Like, how would you, how would you, because I mean, there's so many, there's so many good drivers mm-hmm. out there. Like, how, how are you going to decide? I mean, because this, this is good info for people. Like, you know, a lot of people that listen yeah, to this yeah, I'm sure. actually drift and right. like some yeah. of them might want to be there. And mm-hmm. like a lot of younger kids mm-hmm. listen to this and they're like, are getting into drifting. Yeah. So like, what, what is it, I guess, that you would look for? In I mean, I'll, I'll be, I'll be straight up. It's, um. If if I can have the if I was in a situation where I'm saying like I'm gonna take a step back from com- competition, yeah. and pick up a kid, my first choice would be Hiroya, 12 year old, drifting in Japan, like f- for sure. He is so passionate about drifting. Yeah. Like I think, and you can tell from the way he's like, the way he is, he probably eats, sleeps, dreams about drifting, like nonstop. Yeah. 
nonstop. That's all he thinks about. And that's the future. Yeah, and he's so passionate about it. And on top of that, he has a skill. And he's so young. You know, he has so many years ahead of him. He's got a lot of time. So you can mold him into something that's going to be like greatness, like legendary status at that age. Yeah. And so he would be easily my number one pick if I was in that situation where I was given an opportunity to pick up a you know, the next generation drip kid. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of talent out there. Like we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of unnoticed talent in this world and in, in drifting. But what separates them from the rest of the, what separates these like stars from the rest of the pack that has the same amount of talent, if not better, is their, um, is their passion, their passion mm. for the sport, their, their, um, their mentality of, I, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure I get to where I want to be. And you can see that from Hiroya. I like Even that. Even at 12 years old, it's crazy. And, and yeah, like you, you just see it. You can see that he wants to drift and be good. I, I hope there's a lot more of those kids. I think there, there are. There are. I'm sure there are. Yeah. Because yeah. um, those are going to be the kids that like carry it into the next, yeah. the next realm, next generation. Yeah. In uh, RDS, they're going to make another... us look bad. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm excited for it. I am too. I like man. I like yeah. that push. I like the yeah. There's like the younger kids in like our area. There's these uh, two dudes and their team's called Crash Style, and mm-hmm. they're like early 20s. And you know it's not super young, but it's, I mean it's, it's still they got super some young, years man. and they're yeah. doing like some really cool driving yeah. and like having fun with it mm-hmm. and like, you know pushing, pushing the boundaries mm-hmm. and it's like. Oh, okay, this like next generation of kids, like they're playing a lot of us. They play a seto every night. Uh, dude, you know? it shows. I play a seto with them, and they're yeah. way better than me. Yeah, yeah. It makes me mad, but I'm gonna get them. Dude. Hey, man, you imagine how I feel when I hop on a seto course and there's ten year old kids like whooping my ass <laughs> in tandem trains. I'm a, I'm yeah. a twenty year old veteran. And they're like yelling dude, at you dude. and yeah, stuff. Like, Come like, on, man, get out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I gotta oh change. God, oh, I gotta fuck. change my fucking name on there because sometimes people be like Palmer, like Animal yeah, Style yeah, Palmer. Yeah. I'll be like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I'll be like, sorry, I'm bad. I like literally have to say, like, sorry, yeah. I'm bad at a seto, like yeah. every time because, like, I, can I don't just even tell. use my real name, yeah, I don't dude, want hide to see it. the shit that I gotta, they talk. I gotta change it, yeah. yeah. It's even better too because then you can, like, get you get that real roast, you know, mm-hmm. they're like roasting you like you're another kid, yeah. And these are like 10 year old kids in like Ukraine or something, yeah, yeah. And that's all they do is like play seto, and they probably got some like wild steering wheel setup, you know, yeah. it's like duct tape to a, <laughs> yeah. like table and, yeah kitchen table yeah dining table yeah yeah they're like yeah. running it on like no like some laptop with like no yeah graphic settings with like yeah. third person view and they're just like door to door it's wild that there, there's so much talent out there um and that's that's kind of the beauty of where i am right now is that i have now the um i guess the opportunity to see my next move Mm. and within that move is obviously trying to see the next generation so i i see i i I watch like younger generation drift kids all the time and the future is promising that's for sure i think so yeah i mean like the information is out there way better than it was when like you started for sure yeah and we didn't even have like steering lock kids we were like using stock knuckle stuff like stock rear suspension welded diff so now it's like all that data and know-how is established. There's like 25 plus years of drifting knowledge here in the U.S. US alone. Right. Yeah. So, and yeah, I mean, kind of jealous that kids have it so much easier nowadays. I, I am yeah. too. I'm like, if I could go back like 10 years. Yeah, with everything you know now. Oh, dude. Oh. Yeah. FD champion right there. Dude, man. they wouldn't be ready. <laughs> nah, I'm not, come on. But yeah. I, I think about that a lot too. I, mm. I kind of want to. That's that's part of the reason that I do this is I want to have like these like episodes that people can kind of like reference of this era and like mm-hmm. talking about like where things were and where we think the future is going to be. Mm-hmm. And if like you know, I think for the most part, like everyone kind of has the same vision of where it's going, mm-hmm. um, because it's yeah. it's pretty obvious. Like I don't know. Do you think? Yeah, do you think like the future of drifting? Do you think drifting will ever be as big as some of the other like larger motorsports? Um it's hard to say because this all goes back to being green. 
you know, and then most automotive manufacturers are making that shift and they have already with like all full EV vehicles, hybrid technology, and they're getting rid of cars with like high displacement, naturally aspirated V8s. Um, yeah. Even, even the V6s, the new um, Tundra, which is a great car, by the way, is a V6 hybrid. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I kind of want one. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Better towing capacity, more power than the Dude, previous got, generation like V8. Dude, it's 600 foot pounds or something yeah, it's with unreal. the hybrid. Yeah. And then you take another car like the Ford Raptor. What They went from a V8 to a V6 turbo. Mm -hmm. So these manufacturers are making the move to see how they can bring down, um, I guess, pollutants, yeah. but increase fuel efficiency and power. Mileage, power. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess the most obvious move is Formula One. Well, they went from like V12s, V8s, or V10s, V8s, and now they're hy hybrid turbo. Yeah. You know, it's unreal. It's essentially like a Honda Civic engine. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like a 1.6. Yeah. And they're, the manufacturers are using these platforms like, you know, Le Mans or like WEC World Endurance Championships and even Formula One to apply that technology into production vehicles. Like what they learn in motorsports is what they can apply into production vehicles. Yeah. Because motorsports pushes these equipment to the extreme, right? For long hours, especially Le Mans 24 hours. 24 hours of nonstop, like full full throttle, full tilt, yeah. you know, full boost. Yeah. So they learn from that and then they apply it to a Toyota Prius. Yeah, which That's is essentially crazy. what it is. It's crazy yeah. to me. And so with that said, like, how do you justify the manufacturer's investment into drift? I think that's why we don't have a lot of manufacturer support yeah. in drifting. So Toyota is actually very good about their involvement with drift. And the way they see it is because it's hard to get the youth movement involved and into cars nowadays. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of kids are into like, you know, computers, technology, yeah, I was, IT. I was with my brother mm -hmm. last night at a bar and he like saw his friend and his friend's 24 and he's like, oh, yeah, I don't drive. I don't have a car. Yeah. There's so many kids nowadays they that have like, no interest in driving. Lift. Yeah, care. exactly. But Toyota sees drifting as an opportunity to retain and gain new interest in the Toyota branding. And that's why they continue to invest. Oh, I mean, like drift. the the GT86 or, you know, whatever it was called initially. The FRS, like GT86, 86, now GR86. Dude, I mean, like, that's all you see on the road. Like, and the benefit of that is for people like us mm -hmm. who will like to take cars 10, 20 years down the road and turn them into drift cars. Like we have to have the manufacturers putting out. Yeah. So like, so like seeing cars in FD that are new, that are drifting mm -hmm. people who are people who are into drifting are going to buy those cars. Yeah. They're capable of drifting. Mm -hmm. And then later down the road, they will be accessible to people like us. Right. Who can't go buy a brand new car yeah. and turn it into a drift car it also helps to have a ceo um basically mr akio toyota who is heavily 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 involved in motorsports yeah so he has like an alter ego called morizo which is like his alter ego name that he does what? He, he has only an alter uses, ego name yeah in motorsports he's actually a race car driver what yeah he does like super taiku or like endurance racing that's um, he's, sick he's ran like what is it bln in the, at the nurburgring um, no way yeah, he has a, he has his own team called um fuck I forgot what it was. I'm a little buzzed now. <laughs> but anyway, like he has his own motorsports program yeah. because he like genuinely enjoys racing. And his motto with the brand now and I'm I'm sure you noticed that the Toyota kind of feel and image has changed in the last like 5 or 10 oh, years. I mean, like, it's gone more like it's a younger demographic. Yeah, I love it. A lot more stylish. Yeah. You know, we have like F Sport now. We have a Gazoo Racing line now. Even like TRD has picked up their their visual visuals and performance. And that's yeah. because he wanted to produce well, they like like sporty, it, trendy, cool cars that are fun to drive. Yeah, they were going yeah. after the youth with like the Scion thing. And then yeah. I felt like Toyota just kind of like got bland for a well, while. Well, Toyota was bland or was bland according to the general consensus yeah scion's goal was to bring back the youth and the lower de demographics into the toyota brand with now a different once, brand name right now once they saw that toyota's vehicle lineup was actually bringing the demographic age the median age down corporate was like well what's the point of scion then if toyota's already doing that job with these new stylish 
fun to drive cars. Yeah. And that's why they're like, all right, let's just abolish Scion then and just bring everything collectively back into Toyota. So that's why the 86 went back to Toyota lineup. We have a GR lineup with the Supra well, and then the 86. And, and like, how can they not? you know i mean like how could they not when you see everybody's just rebadging the frs as the gt86 yeah, right you yeah. know they're like oh they want it to be a toyota yeah yeah exactly you know yeah and it's like yeah. that I, I feel like the release of that car it was like pivotal for drifting oh for sure for sure even before that car science invol involvement with drift was uh, it started off with the tc so yeah. i had a real wheel drive i remember TC. that car yeah, yeah, that car was like actually it was kind of hard to drive at first. Oh no way! I'm yeah, we've uh, developed that car into something that became a little bit more competitive. We had a couple podiums in it, and um, from there we went to the '86 platform or the FRS. How, and how did you guys set that up for rear wheel drive? I wasn't it like didn't didn't they have like the transmission tunnel? It was like a special one because they no, had like no, all wheel no. drive version, or did you have to convert a front wheel so drive? So the chassis itself with the F, the TC shared. Um, the bottom half with the Toyota Avensis and Caldina, which come all-wheel drive globally. Uh, we, we don't have it here, I see, but the I rear see. subframe just bolts right on. No way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. So that's how we were able to go through the FD rule book. Yeah, I was going to say, converting a, I, I remember like reading something about that, and I was like, that's pretty wild, but like, yeah. it's awesome that you were able to do it. Yeah, that was a, it was a pretty fun car to drive. It was a 850 horsepower 2AZ engine, which was essentially the stock engine for the tc yeah that two two point four liter four, yeah four cylinder yeah 800 horsepower 850 out of that horsepower thing? yeah <gasps> unreal like it was all run bc stuff how do you yeah so for somebody like myself and probably most of the people that like listen to this mm -hmm. taking a motor from like three four hundred horsepower to like 800 horsepower is like almost unfathomable or at least well, for me not even that that and en that engine probably had like 140 at Stocked. best oh yeah yeah, yeah. like what how i mean are you are you working with like and like you know how how do you even start like well you... i mean it's easy when you have partners like run bc je yeah. pistons carillo rods these guys that can create one-off pistons um, for custom that pistons for any engine, build. any engine, any yeah. engine, essentially. Yeah. Um, and of course, sometimes it come with comes with trial and error. And some things don't work, and you just have to continue to develop. So, um, after about you know two seasons, you kind of have a solid idea of what you need to do to these engines to have a reliable power plant pushing 850 horsepower at 7,000 RPM for 45 seconds straight. You know. And um, yeah, yeah, these guys have it down and. If it wasn't for them, obviously we wouldn't have these engines. Yeah, it's good to it's good that there's like, yeah, for somebody like me mm -hmm. who I'm, I'm like scared to crack a motor apart. Like I'm I'm scared to do a timing belt. Till this day, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like I like anything that's bolt on. I'm like, yeah. perfect, yeah, let's, easy. Let's yeah. let's break it. You yeah, know, yeah, but yeah. like like something like that, I'm just like, uh, leave it up to the pros. Yeah, yeah. it's cool that it's cool that over time like when you when you first started out and you were like doing this with your dad like your dad's shop mm -hmm. was like where your car lived i'm sure and you guys were like building it together like yeah we um so we actually started drifting only because we watched um initial d when i was like 11 or 12 years old before that i didn't really care about drifting because we were all about rally racing and mm. to be honest i i was like the biggest fan of the r32 gtr doing like one gun runs in Sick. japan like 320 kilometers an hour on the highway like oh my god it was so badass that like the one the one gun stuff yeah like smoky that yeah, was my that? favorite yeah, yeah. my favorite part of any of those videos like my friend would yeah we go to japantown mall yeah and we like go buy a dvd actually i think they're they were DVDs. We weren't. We weren't like early. We had VHS, man. Yeah, I wasn't. You know, yeah, I wasn't in showing. that era. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got. We bought the DVDs and yeah. we like go watch them. And that that was always my favorite mm -hmm. part was the like top secret, like yeah, the Supra doing burnouts on a British freeway. Yeah, over. yeah, I love that. Yeah, it was just like it was just like the most like uh, like I don't know. There's like outlaw stuff. Yeah, you know, like yeah, rebellious. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like this it's like so badass Japanese dude just like. Why do they call you Smokey? And he's like, I'll show about you. To find out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> dude, that's the best. Yeah. So that's that's kind of how I started. Like, I didn't really care about like drifting. I knew about it, but 
at that time, it was still like kids doing it up in the canyons in Japan. And I didn't really care for it until I saw Initial D. And, I, and then my dad and I got so hooked. Like, dude, it's kind of like you and me. Whoa. Because you know? it's Bunta and Takumi. Yeah. yeah so I was like, well, coincidentally, we have a Corolla at the shop. Why don't we go try it? So Whoa. we went. So what? He, he, he ran a shop called Gushi Auto. Yeah. And his coworker or his employee knew of a dry lake bed called El Mirage. And so my dad was like, hey, there's like this open public land that you can drive on without a license you want to go I'm like hell yeah i want to go like i want to try this like drifting thing around yeah. bushes and stuff yeah so we went religiously every week for like two years straight how old were you 12 12 13 that's when i started and um from that that point on we were so hooked on drifting and then that same year in 2001 was when they started doing like uh, what is it? Drift Association, uh, Club 4AG Drift Days. So it was like Drift Day 2 or 3. And th- and then this was when like they were doing it in the parking lot at Irwindale, Drift- Irwindale Speedway. Not mm. even in the infield. It was the parking lot. They're like, no, nah, you can't come in here with that stuff. Yeah. So we had to like lay out cones in the parking lot. It was like second gear m- at most. Yeah. Like first gear, bah, 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 you know, <laughs> around cones. And that was with like Takaono, Moto Miwa. Uh, Hiro Sumida. I don't know if you know these old school names, but they were there when uh, Drift Day like two and three were around, and it was only like maybe a handful of us guys drifting in the parking lot at Irwindale, and we would see like cars pull up on the side of the the fence to watch. On yeah, on Arrow Highway, and they're like watching us, like whoa, yeah. what's that? Yeah, yeah. From that point on, they started to like that that organization started to get bigger and bigger, and then we started seeing like different 240SXs, FCR X7s, the old Camaros, like what is that, IROC Z? Uh, yeah, IROC Z. <laughs> yeah. Um, we saw, what else did we see? And this was actually when the IS300 was brand new. Yeah. So when we saw that at the drift, it was like, wow, that guy's balling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah got yeah. a brand new IS300. Um, and then D1 Grand Prix came to the US from Japan to do like a driver search back in 2003. Uh, and I actually made it into the top three for that. Got my D1 license, did D1, and then the sponsorship just started to like come in like crazy. Whoa. Yokohama Tire, Rotoro Brakes, Koyo Radiator was around already. Yeah, shout time. out Koyo. Yeah, shout out Koyo. They've been a long time supporter of everything yeah. I've done till this day. Yeah. Yeah. I just got my Koyo intercooler. Hell yeah. Can't wait. This was back when they didn't even have uh, intercooler cores. It was yeah. strictly just they like just started radiators. doing them. Yeah, and yeah. they're super high quality. Yeah, so shout out to them for sure. Yeah, yeah, man, early days. Hey, man, I've been around, dude, <laughs> since day one. So, what was it like getting all these sponsorships like before you even had a driver's license? Were you just like, oh, dude, the driver's license story is one like whole different story, but yeah. the sponsorship stuff was pretty unreal. It was it was so surreal until this day. The way I remember it is like, I was like, whoa, these companies are willing to give me all these parts for free while for the last two years, my dad spent his fortune trying to build me like this 240, Mm -hmm. trying to overnight parts from Japan. And now what are we doing? Like everyone's throwing money at us, parts, tires, wheels. I had five Zigan, you know, I had... All these, I had a Blitz Turbo Kit on my SR. It was, it was like, and it was all free. Yeah. You know, I was like, this is kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And um, nowadays, it's kind of hard to find that, I guess that that style of sponsorship because yeah. this was in drifting was this was in drifting was starting to pick up its pace, and all these different companies were literally throwing parts at everyone that was remotely involved in drifting. So if you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I drift. Company's like, take my money, take our parts. What do you need? Wheels, tires. Whoa. It was kind of like that. If you're telling, oh, I'm gonna be doing the D1 driver search. How much do you need? What do you need a cage? Do you need a body kit? Whoa. Yeah, it was. And unreal. parts were not cheap back then. No, because everything that we had to get had to come from Japan. Yeah. Everything. There was no, you know, there was no Blitz USA. Yeah. Um, Grady at the time was not even doing anything drifting. HKS was not around can't imagine yeah so imagine. everything had to come from japan and um it was pretty crazy 
I mean, companies like Gretti have been around in the U.S. for a long time. Apex have been around for a long time. So then when D1 came, they had already built a channel to bring in like our idols from Japan, you know, Imamura and, yeah. you know, Tanaka and Kumakubo, Nomuken, all these like old, Taniguchi from HKS, like all these old school first generation drifters who are superstars essentially. Yeah. And so yeah, I those were our original idols. I can't imagine seeing like Nomuken in the... Yeah, even Koguchi. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had a friend that went to uh, the Irwindale event mm -hmm. And he was just like, dude, you missed out. Like, you missed and out as well. Big. Yeah, that was my friend Dylan. He's yeah. like, yeah. And he, what I took away from that event was that, and I think this is why drifting is the way it is now. When those superstars came from Japan, they were all so friendly, like welcoming. Like, they were, what well, was once someone that I thought was someone that was unreachable and like superstar status yeah. was literally eating dinner with us, ramen with us, just chatting like a normal human being yeah like wow these guys are so cool and i i'm actually sitting next to the guys that i used to idol or that i still idolize watching option video vhs tapes and i'm eating ramen with them like how cool is that right yeah i hope everybody gets the experience i feel like for the most part yeah. in drifting um like a lot of the times they say like don't meet your idols or whatever mm -hmm. but a lot of the time in drifting you should meet your idols. you should definitely yeah. meet like, your idols in drifting we were in japan and like they're like oh we're gonna go to dinner and then like i didn't you know i didn't get like a whole lot of info i just mm -hmm. show up but then it's like chunky buy and like damn bye, and, bye. yeah we're just like sitting there like yeah. eating chicken wings and stuff and i'm like this is crazy yeah yeah you know and uh everybody's just cool and i think yeah. like as long as you have the mutual respect mm -hmm. like you're gonna get it back yeah yeah i for think sure. if you're if you're I don't know how to explain it. There's like, there's like this, like, this, like, I, you know, like, I respect you for what you do. Like, I also drift, you know, like, respect yeah. them. And they're like, I respect you too. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. kind of this, like, yeah. thing. And it works. It does, man. Drifting's so cool. Yeah. The community is so good. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's so supportive of each other, so respectful of each other. You know, I think it's entirely different feel from other types of motorsports. I feel like I feel like you're a bit of like a fan favorite um as far as like FD goes and stuff. Hmm. Um I don't know if that's you're you're a genuine dude, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Like you you are exactly <laughs> who you put out there like yeah, yeah, like yeah. there's no there's no like there's no like on camera Ken and mm -hmm. like off camera Ken, which I think I think I think that draws like a lot of attention as far as like realness, but um how I don't know is that something that you like learn where you like a f did you ever struggle like because i mean you kind of like got shot into this world as like mm -hmm. a young kid and then you're like at events and people are like coming up to you and mm -hmm. stuff like how did you deal with that like how did you um i was just having this conversation with someone the other day even now i still find it intriguing and and mind-blowing that there are people out there that want to come talk to me and want to mm. see me and meet me and i'm still like whoa like is this real like i wake up I'm like that's kind of crazy that there are people out there that idolize what we do and want to be like us and they and then they'll send me messages like oh you're such an inspiration i went to go buy frs because of you wow you know, i want to be you like screenshot like, send a toyota yeah yeah i'm like oh, i'm gonna repost this just <laughs> yeah, so they can yeah, see yeah, it. yeah yeah but yeah, yeah it's, it's so crazy and that's something that i will probably never get used to is having people that want to meet me and talk to me yeah it's just um it's a good feeling you know it, it's a good yeah. feeling that you you're you're you have this opportunity to make someone's life like happy and jolly and good and give them hope that's a good that's a good yeah. outlook i think it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to like put yourself in the shoes of somebody mm -hmm. like if you've never had anyone come up to you and mm -hmm. be like you know but then that goes back to like again these japanese drivers coming you learn from, from them yeah and they were yeah, just so beautiful. genuine and so human like equal they didn't care about their status they didn't care that they were like on option videos you know they were just so genuine and real they were so real I think that's I think that's like the most important thing yeah. to like have sustainability I mm -hmm. think for like the long term mm -hmm. in in anything like 
just yeah mm-hmm. I don't know, be yourself yeah, yeah that's what it is like I'm, I'm literally who i am at the track and here with you and with my friends yeah just drinking beer and <laughs> chugging jameson <laughs> <laughs> yeah um what do you what do you see what do you see the like for the future of grassroots do you think we're gonna grassroots will always be there that's yeah. one thing for sure. Um, when I mentioned earlier about the future of drifting, I was specifically talking about pro pro level right. competition drifting. Right, right. But that's only because we have manufacturer involvement in it. Um, grassroots will always be there. I, I feel like, and I, I believe it. Um, there might not be any like big time money in it, but drifting is something Man, we truly enjoy. Be. Yeah, there's n- never money in like grassroots stuff. Um, there's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, drifting in the grassroots level will not go away, for sure. As long as we have cars that drive on wh- wheels and tires, yeah, like the act of drifting, like pitching the car completely sideways against what it's designed to do is something that's rebellious. And humans naturally tend to you know like the rebellious like well, i think i think anybody yeah. that gets into drifting has a little bit of a rebe- rebellious nature yeah like, like i think the thought of pulling the e-brake yeah. in a in a road car well, you're not supposed to. to like a normal person <laughs> yeah. is like are you out of your mind <laughs> right but to us adrenaline junkies yeah. like i wonder what's gonna happen 90 <laughs> miles an hour <laughs> you know? doing it in like you know front wheel drive car yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the car's like doing this and your friends are like ah! yeah, yeah, I'm like yeah, I've had so a, I've, funny. I've definitely done that as like yeah. a teenager you know yeah and they're like are you crazy like <laughs> yeah. are you out of your mind you're like, and you're eh. like yeah <laughs> yeah I played a lot of Gran Turismo I like know what's gonna happen yeah, you yeah, know yeah yeah grassroots stuff will not go away like I that for sure I think I can attest to yeah I'm I'm a, yeah I'm a big advocate for the grassroots stuff me too and I think um there's always going to be a place for grassroots drivers always, you know, like even for you guys, like super D is such a good, uh, good um, organization that supports that movement. A final bell for sure. And there's a lot of small organizations that help maintain um, the grassroots community. Yeah. 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 I think there's like, there's a lot of people who want to emulate the fd style um and that are like trying to do that and they build their cars in that manner Mm -hmm. and then you know it's kind of interesting when those builds you know they they like they realize like "Eh, maybe the pro stuff's not for me and they dial the build back a little bit and then they just drive a lot yeah yeah like it's always great to see that happen Mm -hmm. i think because some yeah, for it's sure. E- it's easy to get caught up in that dream, you know, like. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's expensive, man. Like yeah. I can tell you because I have firsthand experience of how costly and expensive it is. It is so expensive. When I post stuff on my social media about, like, my competition stuff, and then I compare the the insights and the feedback that I get, compared to like, the stuff that I post about my street car. My street car gets a lot more engagement. It's crazy, and it's also it's because people are they can relate to something. It's relatable. Like this. It's That's all it's all relatable material that people are drawn to. Like they see a thousand horsepower GR Supra, they're like, "Yeah, that's cool, right?" But I'm never gonna get to that level, right? Like I'm never gonna be able to afford that kind of build. But when they see an IS 300 with like a one J swap, like, "Oh, I have a one J, I have an IS 300. Like, yeah, I want to do a one J swap." Like, yeah, you know that. If he can do that in a stock 1J IS300, it gives me hope. So there's relatability that really brings in the engagement in social media, at least. Yeah. So I, that's one thing I noticed, like, actually recently. Yeah, you see the kids just with, like, stock cars, like, yeah. sliding an on-ramp. Mm-hmm. And it's got, like, a million views on a reel. And you're just like... That's because, yeah, it's It's relatable. relatable it's right. like, oh, like, I could go do this yeah. in my car. And, of course, that's something we don't... You know, like, like as a professional, like I want to make sure that all driving is done on track legally. You know, like I'm not an yeah. advocate for street drifting, like, right, at all. Yeah, you know, and I, of course, at one point in my life when I first started, I was watching videos of street drifting. I was like, oh my god, that's badass. But 
there's always well, back more then, to like learn. The only way you could really like yeah, because tracks they didn't really allow it, but yeah, track drifting is the only way you're gonna get better, like for sure. Yeah, one hundred percent. I had one of those kids who's got like, you know, half a million followers mm-hmm. who just does like a bunch of street stuff, like DMing me like, he teach me how to do a backy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like. I told him straight up. I was like, "You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to learn how to do yeah. that on the street. No, you're not no gonna way, be able dude. to go fast enough." Yeah, no. What are you gonna do? Back on the ten to the four or five intersection? <laughs> it's like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like where, like you, yeah. there's no spot. I mean, it's obviously it's possible. Like, but like you should never try that. Right. <laughs> like, like especially if you've never done one before. Yeah. Like, that's not the place to learn. Yeah. Um, and it's it's one of those things where it's like you you have to you have to get comfortable with the the rate of speed and you're not going to be able to do that unless you go do track yeah and, and you know considering all the risks involved other vehicles guardrails yeah. for the track you can do one corner go right straight back to the next corner like repetitively consistently yeah same corner what 100 times a day yeah well what are you going to do on ramp possibly fuck up and wreck your car and drive all the way to the exit and do it again it's like not not really ideal yeah i mean it's yeah you know i made some mistakes when i was younger i mean everyone has right yeah I mean, you learn from your mistakes yeah but as far as like I, I think that's a good point man i really do i i i've said that quite a bit is you can there's only so much you can learn mm-hmm. on the street um some will probably argue that but oh, i'm I, sure they will that might be an unpopular yeah. opinion but yeah. you know Hey, I'm just being real. You yeah. Know, that's that's just how I am, what I think. Yeah. I I've noticed in the last two years mm-hmm. that like grassroots events at ABS, for example, mm-hmm. or uh Thunder Hill, which is the like closest like track that does like just skid pad rentals mm-hmm. essentially. Three years ago, you could probably call them up and like rent it rent the skid pad like a month in advance. Mm-hmm. And now this year, like they're booked out, like people are running, like I was doing this comp series and mm-hmm. they, ha- they had started having to do them on Fridays because all the weekend days are taken. Mm-hmm. Thunder Hill's building another skid pad. For drifting. Yeah. Oh, for just general purpose. Just for whatever, yeah. like because they're all rented all the time. The same case with AVS. Yeah. I mean, every, it used to be like you can go in any time, 50 bucks, you drive all day long, right? Yeah. Now, if you look at the calendar they have on their website, most of the days are booked yeah even on the weekdays yeah and then they have a skip pad too that's also booked it's crazy how like i mean it's a good thing it makes me happy that people are you know focusing a lot more on actual track events right um but it's definitely a lot harder to book either like private track days or even track track days in general yeah Yeah. no matter where you go does that make it I, i have a question also about like the pro car and like testing the pro car, mm-hmm. like you pretty much like rebuild the car after mm-hmm. every season and then you go and test it like yeah. how many times? And So last year or going into the 2020 season, I had one test day. What? Yeah, I, which is not ideal. But that was also because um, part shortages, everything was delayed coming out of COVID. Yeah. I mean, we were technically still in COVID. But um, yeah, 2019 to 20 was just a... Uh, 2019 to 20 going 21 was just a very tough couple of years as far as um the resources went um product availability yeah it was just tough one test day one test day before we shipped the car out to the east coast to go to formula di atlanta oh my god yeah normally we have like at least three yeah test um, but that's like that's that's not enough to get comfortable no no it's like really comfortable we're talking like you know put it on doors and that's why i tell people when they ask me like oh how often do you practice i'm like this is practice you know at the competition crazy like we have to take advantage of every opportunity we get behind the wheel because taking the race car to the tracks to do testing is also very costly yeah tires are expensive you know the manpower to get there fuel to get there the trailer i have to go pick up my trailer that kills a whole day yeah load up my trailer you know it's very costly to do just one test day so um but there's not many opportunities to do testing on our actual cars and that's also the reason why i built this car behind me was so i can get more seat time outside of the competition car that way i stay 
um, mentally ready, I, also physically ready. Yeah. And on top absolutely, of that, like a drift ale. Yeah. And a set of Corsa too, like that really yeah. helps yeah. into keeping me in shape. We mentally. had we had that break where there was nothing, mm-hmm. right? Like, am I a set up? My my pedals broke. Yeah. When everybody was on a set up during COVID for yeah, like yeah. that whole. That's why I started this podcast because my pedals broke. Yeah. On my sim rig and I couldn't buy any. Uh-huh. Like you couldn't buy any pedals for yeah. any sim rigs for like because everyone's months. buying it up. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna start this podcast. But mm-hmm. after not playing a set up for three months and then going to my first event Mm -hmm. after not driving for three months and you know i same thing i gotta like go load my car yeah drive to the track you know two and a half three hours drive all day drive home unload the car again like you know i was time consuming smoked like yeah you know like you have to you have to like keep up that it it's it's physical it is now imagine that plus driving cross country yeah it's insane you know, it's crazy and, and then you and then you ha- go out and it's like small window of practice yeah we get 12 Straight laps in- <laughs> uh, we have to it's it's max it's capped at 12 laps we don't we don't even get 12 laps before qualifying that's we get, insane we'll, we'll be lucky if we get eight that's so that's insane. eight runs of practice and that's like no two, data two qualifying runs yeah basically any yeah Zero to no data. Two two qualifying runs. So that's ten runs before we go into competition. And then what well, you lose on your first round? That's twelve uh, laps you get for the whole weekend where you spent fifteen grand on logistics, hotel, food, flights, everything, fuel, right? Uh, so you throw away fifteen grand just to do twelve laps in competition. But that's the nature of competition. Yeah. Sometimes you end early, sometimes you make it to the finals and win yeah right? so and you, when you do it's that much sweeter oh my god yeah the the feeling you get when you win an event at fd in that level is a feeling that i have never experienced anywhere else yeah it's like all the sacrifices you made all the challenges the hardships are all of a sudden wiped out yeah and it's just like and you're like let's do this bliss. again yeah like fuck it let's do it again that's, next prob- year. that's probably a drug man it really is and that's why i continue to do this because i had that small taste of success and victory yeah you know, here and there sporadically but if it wasn't for that i probably would have given up a long time i was like what's the point of spending tens of thousands of dollars to do you know minimal amount of laps when i can just go to like abs 50 bucks and get like 30 laps <laughs> yeah. in yeah you know what i mean yeah. yeah it happens to us on the grassroots level like sometimes you'll go far and drive an event and your car will break like 10 minutes in and yeah, you're just like, oh. it's but it's like, you know, you're like, you're out like 500 bucks, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not 15 like 15 grand. grand. <laughs> yeah. But and then at those events, at least you have your friends there. Yeah. Uh, and then you're, you're like, like, like you're like, oh, right? we'll go ride in his yeah, car, you know, yeah, yeah, like you can't yeah. go like ride with your boy. No, I'm not going to be like, yo, die. Let me get a lap with you <laughs> yeah. on the Irwin Hill <laughs> bank. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, get in. Yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. So there's a lot of, um, the, the difference in like feeling success and like pure like disappointment and drifting is so huge. Like when you feel, when you like, even when you podium or like you do good, like the feeling is so good. Like it's like you're high on adrenaline, like you're pumped. But then, man, when you don't qualify, holy shit. It's like you're so depressed for like weeks. I, yeah, I didn't qualify at a Super D round. Yeah. And it's depressing. I was I was really hard on myself. Yeah. I the, the hardest person is gonna always be yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean I think that's I think that's like it's important to have those it's important to have those those failures and then like learning to be okay with them. Like yeah. uh I just thought I like straight up doing stopped doing competitions in like 2013 because mm-hmm. I I qualified first mm-hmm. at uh like Sonoma Drift Winter Jam. It's not that it's like a, you know, local event. Yeah, yeah, I know Winter Jam. It's coming up. It is. Yeah. And then I went out and lost them in my first round. Mm. And I was like I was I was pretty frustrated, man. Like it was it was like I, I, and I was like I don't know if I like this. Like I don't really <laughs> like this. Like I like drifting yeah, so yeah. much and I don't yeah. really like want to turn it into this thing. Mm-hmm. And I I just stopped doing them completely. See, but you had a choice. And I wish that I didn't though. Like oh, I wish okay. that I like you know kept going for it. Not not because I wanted to go like the pro route, but I I feel like I, in the last couple of years, I realized like I should do some comps and like mm-hmm. see where I I stack up because yeah, 
you know, just being like a driver where you go have fun mm. all the time is fun. But like sometimes you want to see like wh- where where am I actually, you know? Sure. Especially when you're hard on yourself. You're mm. like, am I good enough? I think at that point you got to also remember like why are you doing it in the first place? Yeah. Is it fun or is it something else? Because if it's not fun, then I think you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. And I, I say that like, you know, it's the disappointment feeling in FD is pretty hard. But at the end of the day, I still have fun, you know, traveling with my team. Yeah, that's across awesome. the country, like you yeah. know, fifty hours in the truck. It's like bullshitting with each other <laughs> and talking shit. You're so you're you're riding. You're not like flying out there and meeting no, them. No, last year we drove all yeah, of it. Not all of it. The first two round, three rounds, um, we had transport, but for uh, five rounds after that, we were on our own. You're just road tripping with the homies. Dude, it was sick. I actually love it. It's fun. Like we yeah. went on one trip to Canada mm-hmm. for uh, Drift Union, Drift Union Invitational, which is like another like you know fun event mm-hmm. like kind of m- more selective kind of like a final bout thing sure. um and like all before it i was just like i don't know like is my is my forerunner gonna make it yeah. like like is this, is this oh like- it's, it's yeah the first trip is like you're like oh what was that sound yeah you i was know? like i should probably get triple a yeah yeah before yeah. i go like i'm worried about like is my transmission gonna be cool yeah, my like, trailer all right yeah like trailer brakes work yeah yeah like are these t- like should I, what do i bring like yeah. you know and i'm like what if my car breaks right when i get there you know yeah. and you're just like but i went and it was a great time and like yeah. even just the journey out there with your friends and like stopping at weird it's places so fun like i like enjoy that you post that kind of stuff on ig when yeah, you're like yeah. dry, like making fun of my team yeah or like when you make like it blasting them yeah. <laughs> or like i don't know you're like in some weird place in the yeah, middle yeah. of the country and yeah it's like, we went to a, a crater that's what i was talking yeah, i was like yeah. like you put some like funny caption with yeah. the crater and i was like i love this yeah it's fun like this is like peak drifting to me because like i i like i that's how i feel when i'm yeah. driving across yeah some weird place to like go drifting yeah it's all fun man if it wasn't if it wasn't fun i wouldn't be doing it yeah that's the bottom line that's like the fucking pivotal information from this yeah. whole thing like if you're not having fun like yeah figure out a way to make it fun right that's why i tell people when they're like so stressed about like trying to become a pro I'm like why are you what are you doing like is it fun no it's so stressful I'm like then don't do it yeah you know stress is going to come in all levels no matter what you do and like there's going to be hardships and challenges but at the end of the day you got to remember why you're doing it in the first place because I, as much as i say like qualifying is stressful and, and like i get nervous and stuff it's still fun the challenges are fun the the, the pressure is fun you know? yeah I mean, yeah, that's exciting. It's like, mm-hmm. I, I like to hear that because that's 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 what I get out of going to an event. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you go and your car breaks, you're like, like should have probably checked that, you know, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. But it's like it's, you're still. But that's the, also learning experience. Yeah, you're like, it's it's still one of those things where you're like, you know, I'm here, mm-hmm. I'm like still doing this thing. Like, I'm not gonna give up and like not mm-hmm. go to the next event. I'm mm-hmm. just gonna go home and fix it and like, you know, do it all over again. Yeah. yep do you have any do you have any advice for anybody who's like trying to get into the pro side like what do you tell i'm sure you get that asked that all the time time. yeah all the time um and most of the time they are very serious about it they're very serious about how to get into it and they're not just guys like oh you know i don't really drift much but i want to be a pro no i I don't get much of that yeah most of the time they've been in drifting for so long they they know how to drift um they're usually pretty good at it yeah but they just don't have the means to get into the pro side like either they don't have the funds or they don't have the network they the don't have the people the time yeah um and i will admit it's not easy it's not easy to go into the pro side because for the most part and i want to say about 80 percent of the time you're gonna be heartbroken it's gonna be an uphill challenge um, first of all, it's hella expensive, and unless you're made of money, yeah. you're probably not going to be able to afford it and justify the cost that's involved to running a program to compete in a full series or full season of the series. Um, but if you're still adamant about it and you have the funds, then it's just all about. Um, honestly, it's just drive time. It's experience, drive yeah. time. You know, having fun in the process of getting better. 
That's yeah. the best advice. Yeah. Just drive as much as you can. Drive, yeah, just drive. It doesn't yeah. matter in what way you drive, just drive. Beater car, missile cars, you know, practice car, comp cars, whatever. Assetto Corsa. Yeah. Yeah, just drive. I think it, like the trifecta is Assetto as much as you can. Yeah. Fun events Half as much five. as you can yeah. in a car that you could drive yeah. a ton of laps in. <laughs> And then go push yourself and go yeah. do some far away events or mm -hmm. go do some comps and like, you know, take it seriously, but still have yeah. a good time. And like, if you can do that all yeah. like consistently, like you're, you're going to get good fast. Mm -hmm. But having fun is the most important. I think I agree. That's like the number one thing. Number one advice. That's what's great about a set Cause you can like talk, talk shit, shit with the boys, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Like, on discord and <laughs> just stuff. crash what into each other. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. Yeah. I, I didn't know about Discord. I used mm -hmm. to just play Assetto like online and not talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. And once I found out that like people, like, oh, it's so much better when you can like, hear them. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it's so much better when it's like you're on a server with your yeah. friends. And uh, if if you're not doing that, like you got to do it. Yeah, you got to hop on it because there's a ton of talent out there. And I'm I'm telling you, ten year old kids yeah. probably from like Poland or Ukraine or something yep. are gonna whoop your ass, and you're gonna feel yep. like, what was I doing for the last twenty years of my life? Yeah. Yeah. But that's how it is. And these guys are probably the future stars of drifting. Yeah. yeah. I think there is like a I think there is like a physical talent aspect mm -hmm. part of it. Like some people just have that like raw talent, mm -hmm. I think. But it but you can negate that with experience and driving. Yeah. What I learned is that raw talent can only take you so far. Yeah. Then comes determination, you know, practice time. I mean, you were one of those, you're like, you're one of those people with raw talent. You were young and like, just sure, yeah. took to it quickly. Yeah, yeah. Like with not a lot, like, you know, playing Gran Turismo doesn't really translate <laughs> right, to yeah. learning counter It did actually a little bit, but yeah. not as much as a set of course it does. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yep. I think, yeah, man, all super insightful stuff. Good. I don't know. I'm glad we're doing this. Yeah. Um, I don't have any other questions, dude. I don't know. You got somewhere to be eventually. I do. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. What well, was that? Like an hour and a half or something? Two hours? Yeah. Just about, you know, so, time warping, dude. Good. Yeah. Hell yeah. No, you like covered a lot of cool stuff. A lot of like important topics that mm -hmm. like I think are important to drifting. And like, just I appreciate you doing this, man. Like. No problem. You're a fucking legend, Ken Gucci. <laughs> hey, I want to leave this. I'm not leaving yet, but yeah. when the time comes, I want to leave a legend. So <laughs> You're already a legend in my eyes, man. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Palmer. Can you buy yeah. those threes racing shirts? You can, actually. Yeah. Those um, are tight. Well, this shirt is already sold out, but we have a threesracing.com website where you can buy our merch. So Sick. it's gonna, a shameless plug, but yeah, check gonna, it out. I was going to throw some cash at you right now, dude. Can I <laughs> buy that one? Some. We might I'll, have some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I'll get you one for sure. Um, yeah. Do you want to shout anything out or anybody or? Um, not really anyone in particular, but yeah, for the guys, especially like the young generation that's you know starting to get into drifting, it's uh, it makes me so happy to see that um, that that passion come out of the gen the next generation, especially these young kids. I feel like there was a big gap between you know our generation and then the, the little bit younger, but then there was a huge gap between that and the upcoming generation. Now yeah. this next like generation young is like super young. Yeah, they're all playing FR Legends. Yeah, and, like, and they're so good. Yeah. And that makes me so happy because now I know for a fact that there's a future in drifting still. You I like I mean? that outlook, man. Yeah. I like that outlook. And so as a veteran, because I'm like almost a 20-year veteran in pro drift, it gives me now an opportunity to, you know, share that passion with, you know, these kids that are up and coming and give them an opportunity to do something that I once strived to do and was, I guess, somewhat successful at it. So, um, yeah, man, it's just uh, it's a great time to be in drifting right now, to see Love it. the sport have a promising future. I love it, man. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's it, I guess. Bye. That's it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>